Muzamil Hassan could very well die behind bars. Today, a judge slapped him with a maximum sentence for the beheading murder of his wife. News Force Trisha Cruz is here now with this dramatic day in court. Trisha. That's right, Don, and unless Hassan appeals, this case has finally come to a close after two years. And for the first time today, we are hearing from both the judge and jurors about a case that made headlines around the world. You ambushed your unsuspecting wife and you butchered her. Self-defense? I don't think so. Up until now, Judge Thomas Franzak never shared his personal thoughts about the charges against Musamil Hassan. But during Hassan's sentencing, the judge lashed out at him over and over. I cannot begin to understand how she was able to put up with the incessant whining, the haranguing, the emails, the lectures, the graphs, the charts, the diagrams, the dragons. It's, it's beyond me. It's been two years since Hassan beheaded his wife in their Orchard Park TV studio. Asya Hassan was also stabbed more than 40 times. Hassan's trial lasted for two weeks. The jury found him guilty in less than an hour. Two of the jurors who listened to the horrific details of Asya's death spoke to News 4 after Hassan was sentenced. To see such brutality for a woman, what she went through, I think will be with all of us forever. Kelly McAgnano and Linda Janigo were not required to be in court on sentencing day. They and two other jurors came for one reason. For Asia. For Asia. For Asia. For Asia. For Asia. We here. sat here every day and listened to testimony and, um, you know, tried to make light of it. And we wanted to see it through to fruition. Unlike his outburst during the trial, Hassan remained calm. He also offered an apology. Sir, I, uh, I deeply regret that uh, things came down to what they came down to. And His statement did not wish. convince the judge who sentenced him to the maximum of 25 years. I am entirely convinced that he is utterly incapable of seeing himself for who he truly, truly is. He got what he deserved. He got what he deserved. Not enough time, but... The two jurors we spoke with tell us that at the beginning, they were keeping an open mind about Hassan's defense, but they say he never proved anything and that all he wanted to do was bash his dead wife. Trisha Cruz for the 10 o'clock news. The views expressed in the interviews and or commentary are solely those of the individuals providing them and do not reflect the opinions of Unforbidden Truth or its affiliates. Welcome to Unforbidden Truth. I'm Andrew. This is part one of a two-part interview with convicted murderer Muzamil Mo Hassan. Mo was convicted of second-degree murder and the beheading death of his wife of eight years, Asiya Zabar. Mo was a Pakistani-American who at one point was the CEO of Bridges TV, which was stationed in Buffalo, New York. The network was designed to counter negative stereotypes of Muslims. Bridges TV premiered on November 15, 2004, as the first American Muslim TV network to broadcast in English. The channel would cease operations less than three years after Mo's arrest. In February 2009, Mo Hassan was arrested and charged with beheading his estranged wife, Asia. According to Orchard Park Police, Mo arrived at the police station at 6.20 p.m. on February 12th, the day of the killing, and reported that his wife was dead. Her body was found at Bridges TV station. Police had made multiple visits to the Hassan household, responding to domestic incidents. They had been most recently called out to the residence on February 6th, six days before the murder took place. On the 6th, Mo was served with divorce papers and an order of protection after it was reported that he was banging on the door and had broken a window out. Mo was quoted by law enforcement after his arrest as saying that killing his wife had felt like it was an incredible amount of relief. I felt like I had escaped from an Al-Qaeda terrorist camp, and the safest place was the Orchard Park Police Station. I felt safe and secure with them. Asiya's sister who lived in South Africa said that her sister had been abused by Mo and she was in fear of her life. Police reports have documented that Asiya had stated that Mo's abusive behavior had started at least six years prior to her murder. An hour or less before killing his estranged wife, Mo went to purchase two hunting knives, then parked his SUV out of plain sight at the TV station. Then he went and hid inside in the news station until his wife had walked through the door. He stabbed her more than 40 times in the face, back, chest, and decapitated her, cutting her head off, some of which was caught on surveillance video. Two of their children plus another from one of Mo's previous marriages were waiting in the car as Mo murdered his wife, a two-year-old and four-year-old, plus a teenage boy. 
Mo represented himself during trial and used his two hour closing remarks to tell the jury how he was a slave of his wife's rage. He never did bring any witnesses forward or evidence to substantiate his claims of being abused by his wife, while prosecutors would note that there were multiple police reports followed by his wife in her medical records which testified to her being the battered spouse. Muzamil Mo Hassan was convicted of second degree murder in the beheading death of his wife and was sentenced to serve 25 years in prison before being eligible for parole. His first parole hearing is scheduled for October 2033. Let's start off um, with talking about your childhood. Where were you born? I was born in uh, Pakistan in 1964. Can you recall uh, your first positive memory or any positive memories uh, from your childhood? Well, uh, there are uh, several. You know, my, my dad was uh, in, in the Pakistani Navy, so he was um, used to take me to his uh, ships. So I have a lot of memories of running around and a lot of the people on the ship would cater to me. Um, so, plus, we had a lot of extended family, and I was the first born after, you know, my parents had been trying for seven years. So it's uh, very cherished uh, growing up. What about any negative memories that stick out to you from your childhood? I recall one time we were all at an airport and trying to send some people off. And then it was a huge, you know, there was a huge crowd, and I was probably six or seven years old, and I got lost in the crowd, separated from my parents. It was very scary, but somehow I managed to go to. They had some kind of lost and found area, maybe it was called something differently, and they were able to make an announcement of the PA system, <laughs> and then my parents were able to find me. They were quite amazed that a young kid like that would do that hmm. or would have the presence of mind to do something like that but I I guess I was not I didn't I stayed calm throughout that episode although I was nervous inside did you suffer any type of childhood abuse or trauma growing up no um, there's a lot of history of childhood abuse for my wife But but you but but you your, you yourself didn't suffer any type of like physical, mental, sexual, emotional type of abuse as a child. No, other than you know, like once once in a while, if your grades are poor, then you know you got slapped on the hands with your you know with a ruler, which is common in British schools where you know everybody gets that. Mm -hmm. But you know, not any kind of kinds of abuses that people go through that you hear about. Were your parents together throughout your childhood? Correct. They were married for almost 60, more than 60 years. Passed away in 2018, so they had been married for 61 or 62 years. Were you close with both your mom and dad growing up? Correct. What kinds of values were you taught by your uh, mother and father growing up? Well, mother was very much into helping other people. So we did a lot of work with that, respecting other people. Dad was also into, you know, achievement. And he was sort of the most well-educated person in our extended family. And, career-wise most accomplished. So a lot of people brought their family problems to mom and dad to solve. So I was exposed to helping people out in that capacity from an early age. Did you, did you uh, attend any type of religious services growing up? Yeah. We, in Pakistan, you know, most of us are Muslims. So uh, my I was raised as, as a Muslim in the Islamic faith, and um, we would attend like weekly services, and then during the month of Ramadan, fasting, and things 
things like that. When you lived, when you had lived in Pakistan, did you ever attend any type of, you know, like extreme gatherings or, you know, what would be considered like right wing, you know, like organizations or whatever, you know, over there um, at the time prior to coming to the States or your family for that matter? Well, when, when we left Pakistan in the 1970s, it was uh, a pretty peaceful era. There weren't, there were not religious extremism that much there. And in, we certainly were not exposed to any of it. Uh, we lived uh, like in a specialized housing for military people. So it was, uh, it was pretty diverse community within, you know, within the Pakistani structure. So we were not exposed to that. So you said you moved to America in the 1970s? My family first moved to Bahrain and then I went to an American high school there and then from there we moved we came to the United States were you able to were, were you speaking English at the time when you moved here or did you have to learn when you got here no Pakistan has a history of British colony so we were taught English in like grade school onward so I was, I grew up with English, but obviously it became more Americanized when I went to the American high school. So what was your behavior like growing up, uh, going back as early as you can remember? Uh, good at school, I was academically good, um, I played sports, uh, the common sports there was field hockey and I was also into cricket. So. There was some of that, and um, did you graduate? So you graduated from high school then? Correct. Did you engage in any type of criminal activity as a juvenile? No, never had any problem with the law. Had you in, had had you been in any um, relationships prior to being with Asaya? Yeah, I was married before. Um, to Janice, we met in um, college, and that marriage lasted 10 years, so we had two children from that marriage, Sonia and Michael. How would you say that marriage was? Well, it was, um, we were both very young, we were in college, we were 20 years old when we got married, so I think there was some lack of maturity in both of us, um, and Part of it, she was Catholic, I was Muslim, uh, but we were respectful of each other's faith. But in the process, I think we both drifted away from our own relationship with God. And I think that it's kind of important to have some kind of a religious uh, roots in, in a marriage. So, so it was sad. I mean, we're she's good people, and. Um, so that's kind of what happened. What What was the relationship like, you know, uh, for that 10 years? Would you say it was healthy? Was there any ever, like, any type of abuse on your part, her part, whether it's, you know, like, physical, mental, emotional, anything of the sort? No, part of the problem was we didn't really communicate very well. So, um, again, that was more due to lack of maturity. Andrew? Yeah. Um, we're in the month of Ramadan and our um, Ramadan meal thing has just arrived so just put it by my gate no right there okay can you tell me when and how that you met Asya alright well Asya and I met online she replied to my posting on a dating website so that was in January of 2000. So she sent me an initial email, uh, nice long one. I did not respond to her for two or three weeks. And then she sent me another follow-up email and the second time she attached her picture in the email. So I thought she was quite beautiful. So I finally, you know, replied to her. So that was our initial meet. We, we met online at the time
time I was, you know, living in Buffalo, New York, but she lived in Karachi, Pakistan. So it was a long distance, uh, mostly an online uh, courtship through emails and instant messages and Skype calls and phone calls. Was this relationship uh, setting up to be like some type of arranged marriage, or was it going to be something that was more like naturalized? Well, uh, I would say it was, it was a bit of a hybrid. Hybrid in the sense that uh, we did not physically meet for about a year because we kept communicating online because of, you know, we were in two different continents. So by the time I went to Pakistan in October 2000, it was sort of, you had already crossed the Rubicon that it will end up in a marriage. So I had even brought my two children for my first marriage to be, to be there for the wedding. So, uh, so I, as I said, you know, probably a hybrid. Hmm. How long had you two been together, let alone married, before the incident occurred in 2009? About nine years. Uh, yeah, we we met in uh, actually close to ten ten years because if you include the dating time, courtship time. What was your relationship like up until two thousand nine? Okay. Well, uh, the courtship period was mostly nice. Although, uh, as I look back on some of the emails, she comes she comes across as extremely needy, like. Uh, if I don't call her back or if I don't reply to her email a couple of days, I start receiving panicky emails about, you know, where you are and, you know, call me, email me. And I was extremely busy because I worked full time and I also had two children who would come over on weekends. So, so it was a little bit frustrating, uh, but, you know, at the time, I was not, I did not have the awareness that such neediness is a precursor to an abusive personality because they got attached very quickly and there's, there's a psycho, psychology behind that. And then I kind of experienced the very first episode of domestic violence on the honeymoon. We had gone to, uh, to north of Pakistan to the hilltop station and she wanted a particular hotel to stay at and I was kind of open-minded and uh, it was at that point in time that she kind of became pushy and chubby and angry and storming out kind of thing which I later explained to my mom after I came back from the honeymoon but my mom said oh she's just young and she'll grow out of it and I kind of did make fuss about it, but for me, a, probably the most alarming thing that came to my attention was on the wedding day itself. I rode in the car with uh, Asya's brother-in-law, He was his name was Arif, he was the husband of Asya's older sister. He had been married to uh, Asma, who was the older sister, for 10 years, and in the car he said to me, you know, these three of their sisters are extremely controlling. They always get what they want. And I remember a chill went down my spine as I was sitting in the car. And when I heard that, but this was like, you know, we we're in the car at the wedding reception. So I was sort of like, shit. Uh, and I asked him, you know, what do you mean by that? And then he kind of started saying a few things, but then there were people outside the car trying to get us out. So I, I eventually wrote this episode to our marriage, marriage therapist explaining it to them, but that was, you know, eight years later. But, uh, you know, in hindsight, that was a red flag that I missed. Uh, but, you know, I didn't have the awareness or the knowledge at that time of what an abusive person does. And then, so that was the wedding thing in the honeymoon thing. In the beginning, when she came out here, you know, things were good and fine. There was occasional 
we had was within six months of her coming here, she wanted to go back and visit Pakistan. And I was sort of a little overwhelmed because I had just spent a lot of money on the wedding, uh, flying to Pakistan, you know, myself, my two children, paying for my father, parents' fare and the expenses of the wedding. So I was financially recovering from those expenses and she was at a bit, she had to go and it was odd because, you know, like when I first came to America in the 1970s, we didn't go back for three years, we didn't have the money and even a lot of the families here when they go to Pakistan, it's every two or three or four years, it's not on a regular basis. So she was not very understanding of my financial situation. It was kind of a full-scale campaign that education became very hot and uh, like pushing and shoving type of thing. I barely ever raised my voice. I was just, you know, try to understand her first. But later on, I, I kind of felt when it, one of the things that abusers have, they have uh, very insecure attachments and they have the people they really only get uh, close to is the, their family of origin to such an extent that it's sort of their uh, kind of codependency, codependency type of thing. So and then the other thing I learned, she'd also gone to Turkey uh, for for college, but within a month or so, she left college and went back to Pakistan. So, which was another red flag that that kind of uh, codependency or insecure attachments. Again, it goes into the psychopathology of an abusive personality. Uh, but those were the red flags that I guess I missed. But, you know, at that point in time, you're already married and you want to try to make things work. And since I had been married before, I was eager to make sure to do everything right to avoid another failure. <laughs> and in a lot of sense, abusive people exploit that weakness and abuse victims. And one thing you notice in a lot of the uh, intimate partner homicides is that abuse victims is usually in their second or third or fourth marriages because the abuser uses that weakness and the leverage to because the victim keeps trying to make the marriage work and the abuser, you know, their demands are never ending because they're seeking control. And the reason they're seeking control is again it's part of their trauma and and, and, and the illness that they're suffering from. So it's not something they do by choice. They have no awareness of it. Again, I did not know any of those things. I learned them from medical doctors afterwards. What I also did is uh, chronologically, I pulled out, like I have like over 2,000 emails. So I pulled out a handful of them. And what I thought chronologically, I can go through them to kind of give a perspective. You with me so far? But to clarify, when you said about domestic violence, there uh, there are two types of domestic violence, scientifically speaking. One is called common couple violence, and the other is called intimate terrorism. The uh, the difference is very big. Common couple violence happens like ninety percent of the domestic violence is common couple violence, which is basically uh, minor mutual and momentary. Uh, it does not escalate, it actually de-escalates without any state intervention. Basically, in common couple violence, you have two good people who there's a family conflict or stress and things got out of hand, but they're both good people, they realize they've crossed the line and they work together to kind of normalize relations or seek couples counseling and so forth. So the problem that we face in domestic violence, especially with these domestic violence advocates, is none of them have any medical or scientific degrees. You know, just because someone is an advocate for a cancer patient, it does not make them qualified to diagnose and treat cancer. So these domestic violence advocates, 
one, they're not needed for the 90% of the domestic violence that's called couple violence. And for the intimate terrorism, which requires medical intervention, they're unqualified. But it's a political construct that they have, so they need to justify their own existence. So they claim all, they claim the 90% of the domestic violence and common couple violence, everything is intimate terrorism, and they alone know how to fix it. And they have made a hash out of this thing, considering 30,000 incremental women have died because, because of their lack of knowledge. And they do not allow scientists and doctors to talk at all. So, okay, what I thought, since I put things out, some of the specifics chronologically, um, I thought maybe chronologically some of it kind of goes back to her, um, some of the emails are from my courtship days with, with Asia, so, which provides some insights that one time on April 13th in 2000, when we were talking, we would talk both on the telephone and emails, and she talked about her mother being extremely volatile, angry, and abusive. And so in the email, she's even asking me that if you ever get volatile, angry, and then talks about, you know, she just got a huge um, lecture from her mom, and then she got really upset, and how she tends to blame Asia for a lot of things and so forth. And that started to give me a glimpse of her abusive uh, household. I started to put these things together after the homicide, but not during the courtship time because I was not really uh, I was not really aware of these things. And then another time, also in, this is on April twenty third, that she's talking about her past relationship with a boyfriend, which was. Uh, she said it was extremely violent, and uh, there was one time she caught the brass vase on, on his head, and then she would say, you know, in this email, she's blaming him that uh, at times he would uh, strike out at me to make me quiet, and, uh, and then she goes on to say, as I told you, I was spoiled and extremely headstrong at that time. So when she wrote that she was spoiled and extremely headstrong, at that time I thought, you know, maybe that's something she's grown out of it. But, um, you know, it would come back later on that that headstrongness was still very much there and the rage is also there. And once you learn about borderline personality, remember I told you how the inner tension builds up and then they explode? That's where all the rage and abuse and violence comes in that explosion. Uh, the other things that I noticed in those uh, emails is that she was extremely insecure, and which is also, uh, that comes out. Now, in May 2000, uh, remember I talked to you about her abusive childhood? and and violence thing. This is an incident that she talked to me about that when she was young, she had a brother that was about 11 months older than she was. And one time they got into a fight. Uh, they were out skating on the streets and they got into a fight and she pushed him into an oncoming car and he died. And this happened on 21st of May, 1983. And then, was this in was this in Pakistan or was this in the U.S.? This was in Pakistan when she was eleven or twelve years old. I don't know what the legal proceedings were done with that, but uh, she goes on. So she uh, in this email she writes to me that a lot of years back he was not feeling too well, but I insisted we go out skating, and then she said he slipped fell down, banged his head against the pavement, and then he died. And for a long time, I felt I was responsible for it. And losing him also meant that I lost my mother. Basically, she would tell me, so this was in the email, but on the phone, she told me that basically the mother rejected her, shunned her, 
the abuse got worse from her mother. So basically the mother blamed her for the death of the brother. And that was part of a very big trauma that she had. So even when we started couples counseling, this was something that came out in the couples counseling and talked about with, with the therapist. And um, it kind of goes into her abuse by her mother and so forth. How how far into your how how far into your marriage did you two uh, go to uh, couples counseling? We got married in October two thousand. We started couples counseling in July of two thousand seven, I believe. Hmm. The homicide occurred in February two thousand nine. Can you talk about um, any specific incidences that come to mind, you know, whether it was mental, physical, emotional, you know, abuse in the household towards yourself or yourself towards her, you know, vice versa? Yeah. Uh, one more thing. Uh, just from this the courtship email, there's an email from June 25 in which she talks about growing up, witnessing a lot of domestic violence between her parents and how it would make her feel so scared and broken and she would hide underneath the dining table or beds holding her brother's hand, the brother who died. And then she also writes that the domestic violence in her sister's marriage scared the hell out of her from marriages and so forth. And this whole thing of witnessing domestic violence in one's uh, home growing up uh, basically, there's a lot of research that says adult abusers uh, are created because they witness domestic violence, which goes into, you know, all the childhood trauma that goes with it. Uh, and it affects, you know, boys and girls equally. So, but again, you know, in the feminist context, that, that women are never abusers. So it's always a man's fault. Now, what happened is, uh, I started uh, saving the emails between my wife and I because she was so quick to anger and rage that it was almost impossible to talk to her verbally or face to face. So I found it safer to communicate with her from a distance through text messages or emails. And then in um, in August of 2006, I uh, reached out to Dr. Patricia Evans. She has written books on abuse. And um, so she advised me to keep a journal and to save the emails. So from that point on, I started saving the emails. So some of the incidences that I'm going to talk about are before I started saving the emails. So I cannot corroborate them with documented evidence, but events after August 2006, the abuse is happening, it is being captured. There was one time in April of 2006 where she became angry and it went into a violent episode. She picked up a cricket bat, uh, bought a cricket bat, uh, and then she started hitting me with a cricket bat. And it's so irrational, you don't understand where it's coming from. So I basically left the house, parked myself in a hotel room, and then she eventually comes back to the hotel to bring me back home. And I said, no, I mean, I don't want to go back until, you know, you seek counseling because this behavior is unacceptable. And she refuses counseling, she doesn't want to go. So basically I left the hotel room, went on a drive, and then, then she called me on the phone promising that she'll go into counseling. So I said, fine, then I'll come back. Once I come back, she reneges on her promise that she doesn't want to go into counseling. And this kind of promises will happen again and again and again. And let me give you the background as to why this happens, if you're interested. I was going to say, this, this pattern would happen a lot where she would make promises to go into counseling and then she would renege. And the reason that happens is... Uh, abusive people have what is called internalized shame because they grew up being abused. They end up blaming themselves for the abuse, so they start to believe the, their shame gets internalized, which basically means they have an inner talk to themselves, which basically tells them, 
I am flawed. I am uh, bad. There's something evil about me. I'm irreparable. And, and all of that. So they have a lot of self-loathing. And that self-loathing prevents them from taking an honest look at themselves or going inside and doing counseling or therapy work, you know, which is unfortunate. And that's why a lot of abusers don't go into therapy, don't go into counseling. So anyway, so that was an incident from cricket bat and so forth. Um, now, in August, um, there was a time when I'd come into my bedroom and I kept my medicine by the nightstand and she was angry for some reason. She picked up my medicine and threw it across the room. And I made a point of letting her know that this is abusive behavior. And then she writes back in an email, no, I did not throw it, I was just removing it. And I write back, no, you threw it across the room. I had to walk over, pick it up, put it on the bedside. You're, you know, so, this is denial, you know, this is what happens with abusers is that whatever damage they do, they live in denial and that denial allows them to keep on abusing. So, uh, to that, you know, these are just some incidences that, that were uh, documented. Now, the, one of the most scary thing for me uh, was there, uh, I remember I told you there are two kinds of weapons they use conventional weapons versus nuclear weapons so conventional weapons being like knives, scissors cricket bats, baseball bats uh, things that you can physically hurt somebody with but the nuclear weapon that they use is making false police reports or false restraining orders and that nuclear weapon is highly effective because the whole criminal justice system has been brainwashed into believing that only men abuse women. So any woman who comes forward, she's a better woman. So our criminal justice system has no ability to differentiate between female batterers and battered women. So one thing that female batterers use a lot is false police reports or false restraining orders or threats of going to the criminal justice system. And the whole idea is I'll get a divorce, you'll never see your children again. And that would scare the living daylight out of me. And so this is one from August 28th where I'm talking to her about her abusive behaviors and how hurtful that is. And um, she replies that, I have no idea where you're coming from. We barely had exchanged a few words. Um, there was nothing abusive in what I did. Please stop sending me any more emails. Um, any further discussions will be carried out through former lawyers. And my lawyer has strictly advised me not to fall into this trap. So she had no lawyer at the time. She was bluffing. But this is the kind of um, posturing or threats that they use. That if you talk about the abuse, if you complain about her abusive behaviors, should go to the courts or the law system because courts welcome an abusive woman as a battered woman. So that has created a situation where uh, abused men are getting re-victimized by the court system. And this is why, you know, when I was talking to you about 30,000 incremental women have been killed, because courts have no clue what they're doing. They're completely, totally under the thumb of these domestic violence advocates. So they judges manipulate the rules of evidence to, to, to produce ideologically pure verdicts, male abusers, female victims. And they're doing it not because they're bad judges, because they've got a gun pointed to their head that if they don't obey these domestic violence advocates, they'll be voted out of office, they'll, they'll be character assassination attempts, and you know, their careers will be destroyed. So every judge in America is doing this, no exception. And this should not surprise you because every governor and every president of the United States is suppressing science to pretend that the Violence Against Women Act is saving lives of women. And this requires hiding all the intimate partner homicide data, which is available on FBI.gov.
so Mo, let's 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 talk a little bit before before we get into your actual um, case that landed you in prison. Can you just talk a little bit about the network that you had founded and everything that you were doing and doing for others uh, at the time that this crime happened with uh, Bridges TV, I believe it was called? Yeah, so basically, uh, uh, before 9-11, I did not really connect that being a Muslim American was part of my identity. Like, you know, I never really considered my religion as a big thing. I was, I was just very Americanized and I mean, I did my prayers to God and so forth. But after 9-11, it struck me that, you know, I will be judged as a Muslim American. And what was also troubling to me was there there was all these people out there who were doing these terrible things, like the ones they did on 9-11. So there's, there's, a, there's a strain of mentality, you know, that's what I call the bad Islam, the violent Islam. So... I wanted to have some kind of a network that communicated positive and healthy uh, values within the Muslim community. And two, I also wanted to give a picture to Americans that majority of the Muslims are not like that. Uh, they're peaceful people. So after 9-11, I kind of was struggling what to do with it and then uh, Eventually, the idea came to me about starting a television network, and I had no no background in television, so I went around asking other people in other networks to start something like a Bridges TV. But Bridges TV was sort of like Telemundo or BET, which was like a lifestyle network in English, 24 by 7, uh, you know, geared towards the American Muslim community and building bridges between Muslim Americans and non-Muslim Americans. So anyways, um, after a while, you know, I couldn't find anybody, but I went around raising funding myself and then starting putting a team together and uh, we built this television network, which was broadcasting in English 24 by seven on cable and satellite. And um, so, we were based out of Buffalo, New York. We created a lot of high paying jobs in that area. And um, so I raised like $10 million to start the network. And then we got on Comcast Cable Dish Network. And, uh, you know, I see out of the, of the TV station with me. And does, does Bridges TV still exist today? After the homicide situation, it got sold to some other um, some other. Ed- some other entity, um, so I don't think it's uh, it got merged with something else. Hmm. So, could, could we talk specifically about the homicide that took place on February twelfth, two thousand nine, and, and everything that transpired that day from the morning up until the evening, and everything was said and done? Yeah, basically, I think February twelfth, two thousand nine, was the first day I was staying um, at a hotel. I came into work uh, that morning, Nasi came into work. Um, well, that was another interesting thing that even though I was under a restraining order, there was a carve out that since we worked together, she, you know, we can work, work hours, we, we can work together. And also in previous restraining orders, even though this carve out existed, so she would show up at my hotel room unannounced almost every day, breaking her own uh, restraining order. Again, you know, they cannot be alone, so they need that self soothing. So anyway, Thursday we went into work, and there we were, Asi and I were in a separate conference room for a couple of hours talking about this whole situation. Uh, again, she um, was angry about me having friendship with Jasmine Han, and I was like, look, I've known her for like 20 years. She, uh, she's... Um, just helping me through the, you know, marriage problems we're having, the abuse problem that we're having. She's a medical doctor. She knows a lot of things about this. But since she knows abusive women, she's also a threat to us here. So she wants me to cut off all relations and everything uh, with her completely. And I'm like, 
you know, so that was part of the discussion. And at one point, she pulled a knife on me, uh, threatening to, you know, kill me uh, if I don't, uh, if I don't end that relationship. Um, so that was sort of through like I don't remember the exact timing, but maybe you know from like 11 to one through the lunch hours, uh, couple, two or three hours there, and then in the afternoon um, she was going to later bring me my clothes back uh, at the office and I was so distraught and that's kind of like when my symptoms of battered spouse syndrome started to coalesce and one of the key things to understand about the battered spouse syndrome it's, it's basically uh, do you know much about the battered spouse syndrome? You know, basically, there are about two dozen symptoms that go with the battered spouse syndrome. They range from, like, the person feel completely in fear and terror. And their anger has um, built up into, like, rage. They feel complete helplessness. Um, of una- you know, there's a complete inability to escape. Uh, And uh, case law basically says, you know, because they've gone through so many cycles of abuse, it's like, you know, when you have a a dog surrounded by an electric fence and every time the dog tries to escape, you get an electric shock. And then eventually the dog gives up trying to escape. And even when you take the electric fence down, he will not try to escape. And that's what happens in a battered spouse syndrome. You've been abused so many times that and you've tried to escape so many times you've tried to get her to change so many times and in the case of battered men the whole system is also abusing you so you have no escape so like thursday afternoon when i was driving around that was the trauma that i was going through in my head and so eventually when we uh, met up to do the exchange of the clothes i snapped and i did what I did because they cannot stop themselves after all this abuse. There's a lot of rage, there's a lot of terror. And so this is an unfortunate pattern of all homicides by uh, abused victims is they always overkill. And on my website, there are tons of, uh, there's a chart that lists like two dozen cases where in every case it happens with an overkill. Like the case law says it's never a single shot, it's five or six, it's never a single stab, it's 30, 40 stabs. So, so let me ask you this then, did you look at those statistics before the homicide occurred? No, I didn't know any of it. I didn't even know something called the battered spouse syndrome or any, any of that. All of this. And then the other thing happened is after the homicide, uh, it happened at the office, I myself drove over to the police station uh, like within five minutes and I informed the police of what I did so like no one knew anything had happened uh, and the police officer you know had no idea so I walk into the police station I said this is what I've done and I was being abused and I just could not take it anymore can, can you can so, you talk about can you talk about the incident from starting with you know going to the store up until the up until going to the police station everything in between that that occurred yeah basically when I was driving around that's when the thought came that this abuse and torture is not going to stop I have no no way to escape I've tried so many times to escape uh, nobody helps you you feel isolated uh, now, the other thing is, with the dog example, an outsider may feel that the dog is foolish if not trying to escape, even when the fence is out. But inside the head of an abused victim, uh, that's what they honestly believe, that there is no escape possible, even though escape to you or to an outsider may look possible. No such abuse, no such escape exists. And that's what the law recognizes, that that's the mental trauma of battered spouse syndrome. So that's kind of what I was going through. That's when I bought the two knives at a Walmart store. And Did you, did you buy the knives? Did you buy the knives knowing that you were going to kill her with them? Correct. And this is also what the case law recognizes, that there's a delayed response. So 
the battered spouse, there's a cycle of abuse. Okay, there are three phases of the cycle of abuse. The first being cycle is I would have their back turned to the victim. So that's when the abuser started to become becoming agitated, start uh, becoming abusive. So not a major abusive, like the major tension that will start and name calling. The last couple calls we. We got an idea of, of the abuse and everything that you have documented on your end. Now I want to talk about the crime that took place. Can you walk me through everything that happened that day? You know, the crime that took place. I know we were talking before we got cut off that you had went to the um, to a store and had bought two knives. What happened from then on, from, from the knives? I know it was said that you were waiting outside the TV station. Can you pick up from there? As an abused victim, you've gone through these well, phases. First of all, I will not use some terminology of crime. So, uh, in a battered spouse syndrome, the homicides uh, usually the, happen the, in the same as one. When the tension is building and the abused victim know the worst is coming, thousands of women so, have been acquitted. Uh, uh, homicide happened like as a preemptive thing just like before the accident. I was so reviewed and positioned by the abuse. Uh, the sad part is. So, what the no case law recognizes is that there is a delayed response. It's not like a uh, traditional self-defense you know, where somebody comes after you with a knife and you shoot them or they're punching you and you hit them back. It's not like an active combat. That was part one of my interview with convicted murderer Muzamil Mo Hassan. For extra content, head on over to patreon.com slash unforbidden truth. You can get access to additional interviews, a virtual true crime gallery, and much more. Thank you for listening. shot him with 11 bullets from two guns. So the actual abuse is not happening at the time when the homicide occurs. You follow? Yeah. And that's what the case law recognizes, that there's a, there's a delayed response that the, the homicide usually happens several hours after the last abusive incident uh, because that's when in their own in dark lone moments the abuse victim realizes this thing is not going to end and there's no escape possible so they they do it as a preemptive thing so that's an important difference that unlike street violence where you have happens, one minute left where the homicide happens during the uh, during the actual combat uh, that's not the case you know, in majority of the cases, the case law recognizes that the abuser would be sleeping.